I will um, provide a, quite a different perspective on loss and damage. Actually, instead of going very, very broad, as Reinhardt has done, I will go um, deep into one aspect of loss and damage where um, where I think the science of attribution can um, can provide some important insights on loss and damage. Um, and um, so whenever extreme events happen nowadays, um, people immediately ask the question, what's the role of climate change? And actually, usually they don't wait for an answer, but they give the answer for themselves. And um, sorry, Coco, but um, so she's gone. That's good. <laughs> um, because people always assume, so the, the drought in Germany last year is a good example that people see, oh, this is a drought, there is low water in the Rhine, so this must be climate change. So this is what we, um, what we, will, uh, what we will have to deal with in a, in a changing climate. And of course, um, for a very long time, there was not much evidence to be had when these kind of events were happening. Um, but what scientists were saying was, well, this is sort of the kind of event that you would expect to see more of or not in a changing climate. But we can't attribute individual extreme events to climate change. Um, and other people were saying, well, of course, we are living in a world where climate change is happening. So of course, climate change is playing a role. And the latter is trivially true, but it doesn't actually tell you anything about what's the role of climate change and how does it affect the event. And then also, it doesn't necessarily tell you anything of, about how you need to prepare for the event. And so I would argue that this is quite important because, of course, um, when we know what the role of climate change is, we can predict climate change to a degree. Um, and we can also predict other drivers, like other natural drivers, like land use change or aerosols, and also social drivers. But of course, they play out quite, quite differently in the future. And with attribution signs, we are actually able to a degree to disentangle these drivers. And when we know where climate change is playing a big role and what this role is, then that will actually help us also to avoid adverse impacts into the future if we if we know what what is it actually that we that we should prepare for um, but of course this is um, so I will just very briefly now give the the basic idea about attribution and then go into the details of where it becomes complicated but where it also um, might become really useful for loss and damage so um, when we talk about attribution um, when I talk about attribution, I usually mean event attribution, and I, I talk about um, the probabilistic event attribution. And extreme events have always occurred. Um, so, and all extreme events have multiple causes. And if you if you absolutely boil down to exactly the individual event, they are unique, and they will never occur in exactly the same way again. But um, what what we can um, but of course, drivers of extreme and external drivers to the climate system can change the likelihood and intensity of extreme events. And that is what we are doing with event attribution. And so um, this is here just a very, very simple schematic slide. So we have an extreme event defined by some climate variable and we decide, okay, ev everything above this threshold is causing impacts, is causing losses and damages, so this is the extreme event we care about. And we then can say, in the world we live in today, so in the world with climate change, what is possible weather in the world we live in? Uh, and we can simulate that using observations and statistical modeling. We can use uh, climate models. Um, there are, depending on the type of event, there is a variety of tools we can use that allows us to estimate what is possible weather in the world we live in today. And then, after having characterized the extreme event we are interested in, we can then say, okay, everything uh, above this threshold is our extreme event, so we have a likelihood of this extreme event to occur in the world we live in today. And it's a bit, um, and the reason why there are the dice is that it's like like rolling the dice. So if you um, if you roll the dice just often enough, you can estimate the likelihood of rolling 
any type of number just from looking at uh, the, the eyes on the dot without actually knowing whether or not it's a normal dice or a loaded dice. And because we know how many greenhouse gases we have added into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we can also simulate using statistical models and climate models what would possibly weather what would possible weather be in a world that might have been without anthropogenic climate change? Because we can remove these additional greenhouse gases from our models' atmospheres. And then in these totally exaggerated schematic, you might then get a very different distribution of possible weather in the world that might have been without climate change. And then if you look then at the likelihood of your extreme event to occur, in this schematic, it's a very different likelihood. And because the only thing that is different between these two worlds is man-made climate change, you can then attribute this difference to anthropogenic climate change and say climate change has increased the likelihood of this event to occur. So that's the basic idea, which is very straightforward. Um, when you actually do it in, um, in the real world, it usually looks more something like this. Um, so this is what, um, what we call a return time plot, which if you're a hydrologist, you've seen many of them. If you're not, then you haven't seen them. But it's actually the, the same thing as I've shown on the schematic before, just plotted in a bit different way. So on the, um, on the y-axis, we have the, um, the magnitude of the event. In this case, it's an extreme rainfall event in the UK. So you have uh, millimeters per day of rainfall. And on this axis, you have the return time. So how often in a given year do you expect this event? Uh, how often do you expect this event to happen? And so the, all these red dots are simulations of possible rainfall in the UK in December in a world we live in today. And uh, the dashed line indicates the extreme events that has occurred. And you can see that in the world we live in today, it's about a one in 20 years event. And the blue li lines, are simulations of possible rainfall in the world that might have been without anthropogenic climate change. Um, and you can see that they are different, but they are not massively different, these two different curves. Um, but you can say by just comparing, looking at the, the extreme event in this dashed line, you can say that because of man-made climate change, the likelihood of this event to occur has increased by about 40%. Or, and that might actually maybe be a more useful way of framing um, framing the attribution is that the same event that we have just experienced today with um, with the magnitude uh, of um, uh, well, it's 13 millimeters of rain per day or so. The same event would have had um, two millimeters of rain less in a world without climate change. And that doesn't sound much at all, but that can make exactly the difference between whether or not your house is flooded. So even, and if you, and it of course crucially depends on your vulnerability, whether these two millimeters make a difference or not. But if you're living in the floodplain, two millimeters of rain a day, more or less, might be um, the difference between you get insurance for your house or not in the expectations of, of the rainfall. So um, I think it's, it's important to, to try and not say, oh, this is such a small difference, it doesn't actually matter. But it, it really crucially depends on who you are, what your vulnerability are, whether, where the thresholds are um, that matter. And of course, we usually do event attribution once something has happened. Um, because usually people are uh, became, became, becoming are becoming aware of their vulnerability when something has happened. But of course, it could be that the thresholds that are actually relevant are not necessarily the thresholds that um, we have observed in the event. But they could be much lower than that, or also maybe a little bit higher. So, um, but so this is this is the basic idea behind event attribution. And variations of that is what will usually come out of an event attribution study. And 
um, Emily has shown this plot before. So this is from, uh, from Carbon Brief, um, just a collection of all the event attribution studies that have been done in the last, well, since the science was invented, which is about 190 studies. And when you look at this plot, um, you see a lot of red, which indicates all these studies where climate change increased the likelihood or intensity of the event. The blue ones are where climate change did not play a big role, and the gray ones are where climate change, well, we don't know. And I think that's very important because a priori, there are four possible outcomes of an event attribution study. It could make the event more likely, it could make the event less likely, it could be that the likelihood does not change because of man-made climate change, or it can be that we don't know because we don't have the tools and understanding to actually answer the question for, for this event. And when you look at this, you might get the impression that climate change is a massive game changer in all our extreme events. But of course, this is absolutely, totally not representative because these studies are done by the scientists who do event attribution, and that's not that many people in the world, and they live in Europe, they live in Berkeley, they live in Australia, um, and then there are one or two individuals that live somewhere else, but, but everyone else lives in these places, and so they attribute events that are happening in their backyard. And also, there are... Um, Usually events that make the headlines are events like big heat waves in Europe or hurricanes in the US or so. It's not necessarily um, events that are happening in, in other parts of the world and that are maybe also where it's less, where the connection to climate change is less straightforward and also much more complicated to model. So these are also not only the, it's, is there a selection bias by where people live, but also by what can we model uh, with our climate models quite easily. And heat waves and large scale rainfall events are the ones that are most easy to, to simulate in a climate model. And of course, it's also what just gets the attention. And so if there are heat waves in Europe, people talk about it all the time. Although if you, it might not be the most dramatic event or the most dramatic impact of climate change, but it's just something that gets a lot of attention. And so of course, scientists are also joining in that conversation and providing evidence. So I think it is very important when we think about loss and damage that we are not that we are trying to be aware that there is a massive bias in what we know and that we don't use that bias then to design all our, um, our mechanisms around loss and damage based on that. Um, so <clears throat> this is sort of the, the large scale um, idea behind um, event attribution and the studies that have been done. And you can also see from the different symbols the kind of different um, types of events that have been um, that have been attributed. But of course, all the, all of these studies or most of these studies have been done on uh, meteorological events, so um, heat waves, rainfall events, and so on. And I now would like to go through. Um, some of the key questions that I think we need to ask as a community and, and in particular not as a um, sort of climate science, physical climate science community, but as a larger community in loss and damage because we need to work together to answer these questions. But I think these are the key questions that we, that we need to address to make attribution relevant for loss and damage. But I think also they are the key questions that to, that we need to ask to do what Coco has asked us to do, to be specific, to, to not just point conceptual big picture policy kind of questions, but to actually try and identify what does loss and damage mean on the very local scale where people are experiencing loss and damage and also where we need to do something about it. Um, so, um, so, you, so I think these are Coming from an attribution point of view, these are some of the key questions that, that we need to address. Um, and the first question is, um, what, loss and, what losses and damages do actually occur? And so this is um, a map from the EMDAT, so the, um, uh, the, the disaster database um, that is 
um, put together by uh, the, the University of Louvain in Belgium, where all the natural um, disasters are captured, so um, disasters resulting from, from um, extreme weather events, there are also disasters from earthquakes and so on, but I, I've discarded them. And this is <coughs> um, looking at, these are the heat waves that have happened uh, in since 1985 to 2015. So it's a bit old, this slide, 2015, but actually the picture hasn't changed really in the last few years. And you can see there are, in Europe, there are huge numbers of heat waves um, where, where lots of death and uh, people affected were, were recorded in this database. But when you look at Africa, there's in most countries, there is not a single heat wave in Africa. And, well, when you look at observational data, then that's not really true. There are heat waves happening in Africa, but we, because the, um, the, the impacts of heat waves are usually not immediately, it's very few people are dropping dead in the street. It's usually that people are admitted to hospital and then die prematurely, and you need a recording system to actually be able to capture these impacts. And if you don't have these recording systems in place, then of course we don't know what the impacts are and what are losses actually from these events to occur. So I think if we, if we really want to understand what loss and damage means, that is one very important aspect of it. And heat waves in Africa is a super obvious um, place where something with the recording of the losses and damages um, is, is obviously going wrong, but there, there, there are other places where it's less obvious, but where there are very different ways of how impacts of extreme weather events and, and therefore impacts of events that can potentially be impacted by climate change interact um, are, are, are very different, and so our understanding and overview is quite very different. And then the next question is, well, what actually is then, if we, assuming we know that something has happened, that people have died, that people have been affected, that houses have been flooded and so on, what is actually the meteorological event that has led to that? And usually what we learn, when we learn about extreme events, we learn through, through something like this, through headlines in the newspaper. And, um, and this could be that it's wildfires that, um, that, that are seen as the major impacts of a heat wave. It could be that death um, of, of people are the ma major impacts of heat waves, but it could also be um, other aspects of a heat wave. And depending on whichever aspect you look at, whichever kind of impact you look at, the meteorological event or the weather event that ultimately is then affected by climate change can be very different. So this is, um, this is just one example um, when you look at it's the same heat wave we looked at in Serbia. Oh, it's quite an old study, but the point is still valid. Um, at the top one, uh, it's the same. Uh, it's a heat wave defined by temperature alone. So which might be relevant if you think about agricultural impacts or so on. And you can see that um, in this one, oh, you actually... Hmm. I somehow lost the numbers. This is the 100-year event, this is the 10-year event. So when you look at the plot, uh, plot, you can see that what used to be a 1 in 100-year event is now a 1 in 10-year event um, in, in the world uh, with climate change. And um, when we look at the same heat wave, but define it at heat stress, so the combination of humidity and temperature, which is what affects the human body, so what's pro probably most relevant um, when you uh, when you think about death, then you still see that climate change had an impact on uh, on the likelihood of this event to occur, but it's much smaller. So there is about a doubling in the likelihood of this event to occur, and both. Both ways of looking at heat wave are perfectly valid from the scientific point of view. Um, but of course, what matters and what is actually what leads to the losses you care about is is very different. And um, and then the next question is um, when we well when we are thinking about and one reason why there is such a bias on attribution studies in Europe and Australia and the US is that that's part of the world that are relatively well observed. But when we do not have observations of, of, of weather, then it's very hard to find out what actually is 
the meteorological event that has happened and that has led to flooding or loss of life. But it's also very difficult to know, well, what we see in our climate models is that actually, is that actually uh, reliable? Is that actually, does that have anything to do with the real world? So, um, this is this is an extreme example, and um, where we have tried to answer the question: um, What's the role of climate change in the frequent droughts we have seen in East Africa? And we looked at very different ways of how you can look at a drought: just the lack of rainfall, but also um, the soil moisture, um, a combination of temperature and evaporation, and so on. And you can define it in very different ways. And this is using, very, using all the models we could get hold of. Um, and you can see uh, and, and, and at the top all the observations we can get hold of. And this dashed line is that climate change basically is, is no change. And everything to the right is climate change is making them worse. And everyone to the left is climate change making them less likely. And no matter. It, it, Depending on how you define it and depending on which models you use and depending on which observational data sets you use, you get very different answers. But the observations that are there in blue are actually not really observations. They are just um, observations from neighboring countries or from um, or, or observations from, uh, from very large scale uh, indicators fed into a model. So we don't know what happened in reality. So we can't really answer the question in a very satisfactory way of what's the role of climate change in these recent droughts in Africa. The only thing that we can say is, well, we can probably exclude that climate change is an absolute game changer, because then we would see it even in the few observations that we have. Um, but what does that tell us about loss and damage um, in these areas where vulnerability is particularly high is, um, a question I don't really have an answer to. Um, and then what we can also do is um, we can disentangle different physical drivers. So greenhouse gases are uh, as one area. So this is, uh, again, the same time of return time plot, but for extreme rainfall event in Kerala, where the blue line is... Um, the world without climate change, the red line is the world with climate change, and you can see there's a very small difference in these two, um, uh, in these two curves. But when we then, and the yellow line here is if we just look at the greenhouse gases from climate change and compare it to the world without, um, without climate change, and you can see that there is then suddenly a really big difference in the likelihood of an event like this to occur. So it's not actually probably um, what what is masking the impact of climate change here could be the aerosols in in the uh, in, in the so local aerosols in in the uh, in the air around that so is actually when we what we see in the observations and then the attribution of that do we is that actually less than we should expect from climate change? And so there might be masking effects from other drivers that avoid us being able to see what the impacts and losses of climate change today actually are. And so using attribution methodologies allows you to disentangle these different drivers in some ways. And then the last big question is, of course, there is not just the physical world. But what leads to loss and damage is actually, to a very large degree, div driven by vulnerability and exposure. So who is in harm's way and how vulnerable are they? And um, this is something where we haven't quite, um, where in the mo more recent attribution studies that we've done, we always address vulnerability and exposure in a qualitative way. But of course, that is very different way of looking at data. So I think to to really understand loss and damage locally and address it, we need to find frameworks where we can talk about vulnerability and exposure and the changes in the hazard in the same way so that we can identify, okay, where is 
the hazard changing and why? So how can we predict that? How, uh, what, what's the role? How has the vulnerability and exposure changed? How can we predict that so that we can use all this to be prepared for future loss and damage? And so just um, as my very last, um, there are lots of difficulties with event attribution, especially in developing countries where loss and damage is actually the most relevant. But there are also is a huge progress. So starting from the 1st of November, the Copernicus, the European um, Climate Service, is actually piloting operationalizing event attribution so that we will move away from this very patchy scientists just do what's in their backyard um, attribution to having a more comprehensive and more regular look at extreme events that are affecting well, that are relevant for Europe, but that is a relatively broad definition. And by doing this, we will get a better understanding of what the impacts of climate change actually are today, which, even if all these other questions are very difficult to answer, can be quite useful in understanding loss and damage. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Freddie. Um. Okay, we have one time for one question or so. Coco, I think you have a question. We have a. Oh, thanks so much. Um, first of all, thanks, Reinhardt and Freddie. Really great presentations. Um, Freddie, a quick question to you. Towards the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned um, there was a, a comment about relevant thresholds. Some thresholds are actually lower and some are a little bit higher. So I'm wondering what insights could you share about what the relevant threshold, where are they? And partly that's against the background of these um, IPCC special reports as well as assessment reports have a framework, reasons for concern. And some of you may know these burning embers. And the burning embers on the y-axis usually have something like temperature. And the variables that you're looking for here are additional than just temperature change, right? So that's really interesting. Um, and then you'll have different, different reasons for concern. Um, the new special reports are looking beyond the traditional reasons for concern. So for example, um, singular large disruptive events is a traditional reason for concern. A new recent reason for concern includes food security. So they're getting more specific in a way. So I'm just wondering, with that background of this reasons for concern, what does your research tell us about where these thresholds are, where risk might change from moderate to uh, more significant or from you know important or high risk to very high risk? Does that make sense? It, it does make sense, but I think it's a very difficult question to answer because, um, uh, of course, it's it's very... The problem with these reasons for concern is that it's it collapses everything that's happening on very localized with very different vulnerabilities into global overview figures. Um, but I think to, to answer the simpler part of your question, uh, when you, where you said, what, do we, what can we learn about where those thresholds are? So for example, we did an attribution study on the rainfall associated with the Hurricane Harvey, where um, the event was so massive that even if the event would have been half the size it was, actually the damages would be pretty much the same. And so, and that then um, could, and from from that, I think you can then learn something about, okay, this is, uh, okay, we have experienced this event and we have looked at what's the likelihood of this event to occur. And it's still super rare, even in the world we live in today. But we have, from the damages that we see, we actually see that the measures, the adaptation measures, would have been, would have failed by much, with a much lower rainfall as well. And so using that, then it tells you, okay, this is sort of the type, this is where our vulnerability is really high, and we can then look for the future how of this threshold, based on this threshold, how is the likelihood changing? And I think that's that's sort of a 
a much simpler way of what I meant, how we can learn from that. But of course, to translate that then in a global burning ember is again very difficult. I think we probably have a lot of questions and we'll continue discussing that. So for sake of time, thank you, Freddie. Fascinating work, as always. And um, we now have Jonas Wokerman, who's going to, I'll pull up his slides. <laughs> Applause. Yeah. Thank you.